Uh, so is everybody for some car hacking? Yep. Woo! Oh, it's dreadful. Is everybody ready for some car hacking? Woo! There we go. Uh, so sorry for the slight delay, but we're good now. Um, I am Scott Helm, and I'm here to talk about some research that you may have seen recently that I took part in on hacking a car called the Nissan Leaf. Um, I did this research with another researcher from Australia. You may have heard of him called Troy Hunt. Um, and I'm here today to talk through the actual technical details behind uh, the hack that we performed. So, I just want to get a few little things out of the way to save some time in the Q&A. Yes, I do drive an electric car, so it's a slightly better call than that. No, it isn't a milk float. For those of you that are into your vehicles, it's uh, a common joke that I get. How big is the battery is usually the next thing that comes up. Enough to run your house for two days or more is the answer. Any electricians or hardware engineers in here that like details about electronics? We can take up to 50 kilowatts DC power into this, so we are playing around with a pretty hefty piece of equipment. Uh, people always ask me how far it'll drive, so 70 to 100 miles again, save the Q&A time later. And it cost me about £2.30 to charge it. So hopefully that's most of the Q&A out of the way, done and dusted, and we can move on to some technical details. One of the things that initially interested me in the car um, was actually just how cheap it was. But the other thing was an application that came with the car. The Leaf dates back to 2011 and it came with an application called Car Wings. It was a very good selling point for the car, uh, especially where I live, further up north in the Pennines. Typically it's really cold in winter and we can do really awesome things like controlling the air conditioning and the heating from the app. You look outside, it's snowy and frozen, you can crank up the heating in your car and it'll de-ice itself. It's just a lazy IoT feature thing that we don't really need because we've lived without it forever, but it's cool and it's shiny, and this is what we got. With EVs being new as well, um, you can do things like check your battery status and your range, and it basically just hooks into the car systems and gives you access to some of the basic features in there and certain pieces of information. There is nothing particularly functional in it, it is kind of just IoT fluffiness. Um, it's been around since 2011. The, the API that sits behind this particular application is an XML API. I think, I'm pretty sure actually, that Nissan outsourced the development of this, of this. And that always goes really well, as I'm sure everybody here knows. Um, and as a result of kind of all of the early adopters picking up EVs and being interested in electric cars, there's actually a lot of work done in documenting the API behind this. So when I did try to start to take some time looking at this, there's actually already a lot of stuff out there as well. Um, to the point where it's basically fully reversed. You can literally go to GitHub and download like an entire mapping of their API with every single possible parameter and, and thing that you can do with it. So the, the Carwings API was really well documented. And as far as I could tell, the Carwings API was actually secure. As far as I can tell. There was only one instance when I found that the application was talking over HTTP, uh, Nissan patched that out, and it was all pretty secure. But it was outsourced, it was terrible, it was hugely unreliable, and as a result, Nissan took a lot of flack for that. And they, oops, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot which slide I was on then. This is why you don't change slides before you talk, guys. So with the Carwings API, you have the application on your smartphone, Android or iOS, and that communicates with the vehicle via a proxy at Nissan, you don't actually get direct comms to the car. And this is one of the things that I was a bit miffed about initially when I started doing the research, was that I was kind of hoping I could go directly at the vehicle, which would have given me a little bit more flexibility than we had. But everything is actually proxied via Nissan. All the comms are secure, the API look good. Nissan, interestingly then, uh, send an SMS to the vehicle to kind of wake the car up. And I know this because if you dismantle your dashboard and take a little module out behind the dashboard called the TCU, which is the Telmax Communications Unit, there's a SIM card in there, and if you pop that SIM card into a phone, it registers to the network with an international number. If you then do any action on the application, the SIM card receives an SMS. The phone that it's now in gets an SMS. So I thought, awesome, this is great. I can just get the mobile phone number for this SIM card, and then text commands at the car, and kind of bypass Nissan in the middle here, who are terribly unreliable. It didn't work, unfortunately. If you trigger any of the actions in the application, the SMS that the car gets is actually generic. It is literally just a wake up command. So all that we can assume at this point is that it wakes up possibly the data modem inside the car and it makes a connection back and then pulls some kind of command back from Nissan. So unfortunately, generic SMS wasn't something that we could use. But as I said a minute ago, because the application was so terrible and so unreliable and Nissan took so much flack because their little part in the middle here kept not working, they built a new app called Nissan Connect EV. 
And it was basically exactly the same. It's got exactly the same functions, except it was a brand new application, and they moved over to using a JSON API. So they rebuilt the app, and they rebuilt the API behind it to try and make it more reliable. Uh, it was released in December 2015. Most of the apps hit the App Store literally in the first days of this year, so it's only been around since January. As a result, it had very limited exposure. It's not had the kind of last four or five years of the like, you know, kind of the uh, EV community. They tend to be early adopters, people that are into technology, so they get a lot of scrutiny on these things. But I can say that the new API, the Nissan Connect EV API, was definitely not secure. <laughs> <laughs> So this is now how the new Nissan Connect EV app talks with the API. So I thought, you know, okay, they'll have stood up a new API, kind of a similar model to before, um, but it actually wasn't. So the app still talks HTTPS, but they actually now talk to an, a, an API hosted by a third party. So again, we're going with the awesome third party hosting, nothing can go wrong. Navi is the company that make the infotainment system, like the nav and the head unit and everything in the car. So they're now actually hosting the API that Nissan's application talks to. The really interesting part then is that they just hook into the existing carving system, which then just sends an SMS to the car, and they then just dial back. So it's exactly the same thing. Uh, I assume the comms between Navi and Nissan are secure. Unfortunately, I'd have to be like a tier one ISP to kind of see those comms. Um, so we don't know exactly what's going on there. But there is some kind of link between them and they literally just hook into the carving system and it does exactly the same thing as before. It is slightly more reliable now because Navi can keep their API up and I assume because they've alleviated a lot of load off Nissan that they can kind of like keep that going with more reliability now. Uh, so they've literally just added another link into the chain. So this is, this is kind of where the problem starts. And if we want to get into these communications here somehow, if we want to start seeing what these uh, messages and commands that are being sent backwards and forwards are, we need to get in the middle of one of these communication channels to start seeing what's actually going on. And the easiest one for us to get in the middle of is the one between the device and the Navi API, because we control the device, we control the phone. So I can do things like installing a certificate on there, getting a router on there, and starting to intercept the traffic. And it's exactly what I did. So if you ever want to become a little miniature NSA for your own device, you can get your phone. I use a program called Fiddler. Uh, there's a couple more, you can use burps, app, things like that, any kind of HTTP intercepting proxy, sit that in the middle, and you can watch the comms going backwards and forwards from your device. For those of you that saw the NSA <laughs> slides, you'll recognize this part. So this is basically exactly what the NSA did on a global scale, except you're literally just doing it for your phone. And this takes about two minutes to set up, so you can actually just decrypt the entire communications coming in and out of your device. So we started mapping out the API. I sat in the middle, and I would start from the beginning. So we're going to actually start looking at the, the requests and the commands that get sent from the device now. And the first one that goes out is the authentication request. So you open the app, first thing that it asks for is your username and password. So this is the actual raw request that gets sent. There's a couple of things to, that are worth pointing out here. First of all is that it's a GET request. So a GET request is basically, I mean, this is basically just the address that you would type in the URL bar of your browser. So you could literally just copy that whole thing. This is actually just one long address. I've broken it onto multiple lines to make it easy to read. But you could literally just copy that and paste it into your browser. This is the kind of request that the application is making. It's not a post request, so there's no payload data, and there's also nothing of any significance being sent in the HTTP request headers. So you can just send this from anywhere. This is literally the only data that the app is sending. So you can see the address and the endpoint that we're sending it to. It's got some folder called orchestration. And we're hitting the user login request endpoint. It seems fairly normal. Uh, we've got a region code here. Uh, after a little bit of reversing, we found there's only four region codes. Uh, the N stands for Nissan. We have things like E for Europe, NA for North America. There's a couple of others. Uh, language, fairly self-explanatory. We have this DCM ID value. Um, I think if I remember correctly, it was a nine-digit numeric number. Um, but it's this value, we didn't know what it was initially at the beginning. The VIN number, pretty obvious. You can go up to any car windscreen and actually just read the VIN number straight out of the windscreen. If you want to have a look outside, it's always on the passenger side. So you just walk past the passenger side of the car, and the VIN number is always visible on the dashboard. Uh, time zone, Europe, Paris, again, doesn't really matter. And then obviously the crucial two things that we have here, the user ID and the password. So we fire this GET request at the API. This is the only data that's sent. And we get our JSON payload back from the API. Now, I've trimmed this down. This is a huge, massive response. I've just trimmed it down to some of the important data that that guy's head's obscuring. <laughs> um, 
So it gives us our nickname back, which is just a user ID. We have things like the owner ID, as far as we can tell, just a unique identifier for each customer. Uh, we had an array of information about the vehicle. Um, and the crucial ones that we were looking for are things like the authentication or session ID token. So something that we are then going to use to persist our authenticated state on the rest of the requests against the API. So everything looks great up until this point. It all looks perfectly you know, good and what you would expect. So the next thing was to issue a climate control on request to the car. So it's like, right, okay, we're logged in now, we're authenticated, let's hit the API and tell it to turn on the air conditioning. So again, we're hitting exactly the same address and folders, except this time that the endpoint is called AC remote request. Uh, we've got the region code and language again, the DCM ID that we didn't know what was, uh, the VIN number for the vehicle, the time zone, and then we've got the user ID and the car type. Now, this is a GET request. There's no post payload, and there's nothing of any significance in the request headers. Just think about that. So we send this request against the API, and we get the response back. So the response comes back and says, state is 200. And we're thinking, right, OK. So that didn't look like that it should have actually worked. But this is a traffic log. This isn't us doing anything. We're not manipulating anything. This is actually a straight traffic dump from Fiddler. So let's take a closer look at that request. So we've got the region code. We know there's only four. We can probably piece that together. The language, pretty obvious. If my car's in the UK, there's a very good chance that the language is going to be ENGB. The DCM ID, we were stuck on this one because we didn't know what it was or how to get it. Uh, the VIN number, again, I said, I can, I can literally just walk up to your car and read it out of the windscreen. There's other ways of finding VIN numbers online. And VIN numbers as well, the prefix is per manufacturer. So like Nissan has their own prefix. And like the last eight digits are literally just the serial number of the production line. So it's like one, two. So as long as you know that it was built by Nissan and you can count from one to a million, you can enumerate all possible VIN numbers anyway. So it's not really kind of that important. Uh, the time zone, again, for some reason, you're at Paris, it was, uh, it was always set to that. So again, we can guess this, we could enumerate the potential values. But then we got stuck on the user ID. The car type was always empty, so we just completely ignored that. So to actually forge this request, to build this request, we needed user ID and whatever the DCM ID was. And we could either get a specific VIN from a car or just guess them all. So the problem values were that DCM ID and the user ID now, is FC in here anywhere? I'm pretty sure that you could get me someone's user ID. The user ID is either actually a username or an email address. And I'm pretty sure somebody like yourself could social engineer. A username you potentially register on a forum. I know certain people use the same usernames across many services. We all do. You know, it's not really secret. If you're an American customer, the user ID is actually just your email address. So if you have an American car or any other region, it's actually just the person's email address. So we can say that we could get the user ID potentially fairly easily. But the DCM ID was still a problem. It was a nine-digit number, which is a very large amount of requests to send against the API. You would probably just knock it over. So we were stuck at this point. We were like, we need, this is all we need to issue the request, and we need these two pieces of information. If you get SC or Jess has got some chocolate, she could get your username out of you quite easily. But we were still stuck on the DCM ID. I was thinking, like, man, you know, we need to figure out what this value is. We did some research. It turns out it's the digital communications modem ID. It's like some serial number for a component in the car. And we're trying to find ways, like, can I get this number any other way? And it turns out, no, you can't. And I was a bit bummed because this is the last bit. This is all we needed. So I just thought, screw it. What happens if I just delete it, shrink the request? <laughs> <laughs> and the API responds with the 200 status and turns on the air conditioning in my car, which is parked outside on the drive. So I was like, oh my god, we just spent all this time trying to find the values for this post, the, the get request against the API. And it turns out that like, if you can't be asked sending the values, you can just drop them and it will still accept the request against the API anyway. So we got the same status uh, message back. But there's something really interesting in that response that I got back from the API. What, was, what, what were the two parameters that I dropped out of the request? The DCM ID and the user ID. And the API has just given me the user ID back in the request to turn on the air conditioning for the vehicle. So not only do I now have control of functions inside the car, it's just leaked a potentially useful piece of information back to me in the response as well. So I can now put the user ID back in the rest of the request if I want to, but it doesn't really matter anyway. So we kind of sat here now and I was like, okay, you know, we pretty much know that the API is a bit duff, and we can just go through and enumerate the rest of the endpoints that control all of the, all, all of the different kind of specific features in the car. And I was like, right, okay, so we dropped out 
two of the variables in the, re the request there. <laughs> Do we actually need to send the rest of them? Can we save some bytes on the wire? So I was like, language? Does the API care what language my application's in? And what about the time zone? Again, does it really care where I am and what the time zone is? And this car type thing's always empty anyway, so why don't we just drop those out, shrink the request even more, and fire that at the API? <laughs> <laughs> response. So it basically getting to the point now where we'd already got control of the car, and we were just literally doing it for the walls to see how much we could shrink it. And that was as small as we could go. And I think the only reason that it needs a region code is, as far as I understand from some unofficial sources, is that they do some internal routing on how they send the SMSs to the vehicles, so they just need to know which continent to send the SMS request to. So that's the only reason that's actually uh, kind of required on that request. So at this point we found all this out, Troy was really excited, and he was sat in Australia and looked exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the point at which we did like the YouTube video, you may have seen it on the news, it got circulated quite widely. So we did the little the YouTube video, and I was basically sat in my freezing cold, like, raining car in England, and Troy was on his, like, you know, beautiful beach housing, and he was turning on the heating for me in my car as we were having a Skype call. So at this point you can literally control all of the functions that the app can control in my car remotely, but without knowing anything about who I am or where I am, if you can either guess the VIN or just get the VIN of my car, then you can control it. Uh, just to make sure that we, you know, this was definitely all correct and kosher, we wanted to find a vehicle that we hadn't touched before, we didn't have prior access to. So thanks very much to Joe over there. He dedicated his car to this research and gave me his VIN number and permission to attempt this. And we validated this, you know, never touched the car, never been to it, got a VIN number for a random vehicle, obviously ethical, we had consent from the owner, and we proved it, we could do this, we could sit there with Joe's car, he was outside the office, I remember the day he was outside the office, I was like, go outside and have a look, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the heating's on in your car, it should be nice and warm when you get back to it. So at this point we had full control of all of the features in the application, and at this point we'd already started going through the responsible disclosure process with Nissan. Um, but I was like, what more can we do? Like, what else is in there? We can turn the heating on and off and, and mess about with things like charging. Uh, but one of the things that the telematic system does in the car is that you can kind of go and load like a little graph of all the history of your driving. So you can say, <coughs> how many miles have I done each day this month? How, you know, what's my economy look like over the last month or whatever, you know? Um, so it, it logs all of the journeys and all of the trip data and things like that in your car. And when you try and load the graph inside the app, it hits a, an API endpoint called Price Simulated Detail Info Request. Uh, again, this was a big, huge request. I've already cut this down and got rid of all the bump. Uh, but again, you just need the region code, the VIN, and then this time, the month that you want the data about that particular vehicle for. You have to remember, at this point, we are not authenticated. Literally, the only piece of information that I'm giving to this API is the VIN number, which is publicly available. You can see it through your windscreen. I can just enumerate it. And with this request, I then get back a JSON payload that literally contains every single journey that you have done in your car for the month that I requested it for. So I can literally see every single time that you've been anywhere in your car. Is that including geographical information or just journey distance? Just journey for this one. Yeah. Coming on to geographical. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, this is awesome. I pulled mine down and I had like 380 different entries. Uh, it's got a unique trip ID for the day. Electric mileage is actually your economy. Uh, so I got 2.6 miles per kilowatt hour of power. Travel distance is in yards, so this was a one mile journey. And then you have a GPS date times for the journey itself. And I was like, right, okay, this is, this is kind of super handy because although it didn't actually contain the GPS coordinates, I was like, you know, I could still build up a profile of like when you leave the house, when you're back at the house, when you do lots of driving. It's kind of getting into the realm of like way too much information to know about someone but we were missing like that really crucial GPS coordinates. So I thought this was a pretty big data leak. I wouldn't like somebody to have literally like this level of accuracy of my travel log. I think that was just such a blatant oversight. But during our disclosure process to Nissan, <coughs> Nissan released a press statement saying, hey, super awesome, we are releasing a new update to the Nissan Connect EV application that will allow you to GPS locate your vehicle in real time anywhere on the planet. <laughs> so this is literally what you can now do with the new version of the API. You can open the application and you can hit the endpoint for the live GPS location of the car. It takes about 20 seconds to come back and you literally get to within a metre accuracy of where my vehicle is at the point that you made the API request. Now, uh, the 
the actual press release came out, as I say, during the process that we were going through, like the disclosure process. And I knew that they were already pushing out an update to the app store. I was kind of hoping that the update to the app store was to fix our disclosure, but it wasn't. It was actually just to introduce more bugs. <laughs> um, and the only problem with this is that when you can actually enumerate the VIN numbers and get the GPS location for each VIN number, you can then do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, this is a mock-up. I wouldn't actually do this because that would be highly unethical. So this is, of course, a mock-up of the GPS data. Of <laughs> Definitely would not have enumerated them all on the GPS pin. I actually had one of the world, but it was completely meaningless because there's so many pins you can't actually see. what It's just pins. It's like you can't see it. So I did the UK instead. But this is basically what you could do with the API. Now, at this level, this is kind of just enumerating VIN numbers. We're at the top level here. You can enumerate through them all and find the location of every vehicle. It's not like kind of too personal or specific, but again, I could just go and walk past like your car, get the VIN number, and then just track you in real time. So your car is now being used as a tool to literally track your location in real time. Uh, and it's cool, of course, like it's part of the responsible disclosure process. We went through all this, we proved it, we got all the data. The responsible thing to do is to tell the ICO. Nissan have been naughty, they need to be reported to the ICO for the various breaches. So I notified the ICO, and these slides are a little bit new because they only got back to me last week. It's like they knew I was going to steal guns, talked about this, and sent me a formal <laughs> response that I could quote. So, sent all of the information over to the ICO, and I got an email back from them. And the ICO, by the way, if you don't know who they are, sorry. They're the office responsible for the enforcement of Data Protection Act and also responsible for freedom of information. So they're responsible for enforcing the Data Protection Act on organizations that might breach it. And I got a response from them. Nissan have explained that whilst they did identify some vulnerability in the Nissan Connect EV smartphone application, this would not provide access to personal information unless the individual has prior knowledge of the car owner. Now, I somewhat disagree with that, because I consider my live, real-time GPS location to be quite personal, whether or not you know who I am. Again, it could be targeted. Someone could have got my VIN number off my car, or they could just be tracking me as part of you know, every single vehicle on the world, in the world that has this system on it. So I kind of disagree. And the, the Data Protection Act, again, not a lawyer, but the Data Protection Act says that any information about you that could be linked to you with other information that the company has so they leaked all my GPS data and information, but Nissan have the information that ties my VIN to me personally. And as I understand it, that should make it personal information, even though they didn't leak my name. But the ICO disagreed. And they went on to say, further down the same email, in light of this, we've decided that it's unlikely that Nissan has complied with the requirements of the DPA. This is because Nissan has failed to keep personal information secure. So in the same email, they've told me that the information that they leaked was not personal information, but they failed to meet the requirements of the DPA because they didn't keep personal information secure. So they've literally contradicted themselves in the same email. And I was kind of like, okay, well this, you know, this is now going in the right direction. That, oh, Nissan have failed to comply with the DPA. I was like, all oh, right, we might actually get some action. If any of you have dealt with the ICO before, you'll know that you never get any action. Sometimes get a few So I was like, oh great, this, you know, this is going really well. They went on about how they, you know, they've done this and that and and they didn't feel that they'd met their obligations, their legal obligations under the Data Protection Act. So you're reading through an email, right? It's going okay. You think you're about to, to get the outcome that you want. What is the word that you don't want to appear next in that email? However. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, really? So I get like three quarters of the way down this email. I was like, oh, this is going really well. And the next paragraph literally starts with however. However, in light of the steps that Nissan have taken to update this service and the additional security they've put in place, no further action is required at this time. So you can basically kind of do whatever you want and have a really sloppy API and leave loads of sensitive information about people, but as long as you patch it when some security researcher finds it, whenever that may be, the ICO basically don't seem to want to kind of get involved or know. I was really disappointed with this. It came back to me last week. I was hoping to have a success story uh, to tell at Steelcom, but uh, no, unfortunately, it's, you know, they say that they put additional security in place, they didn't, they just checked for the authentication token that they sent back, so it's not really additional security, <coughs> it is just security, they put security in place, because there was none there before. So as I say, I was really disappointed about this, um, I, I wanted a success story, but we didn't get one. And there's some really interesting key points in here as well, the live GPS tracking for me was the biggest thing, it was literally 
you know, that's like super stalker crazy. We don't want people live GPS locating our vehicles. The other interesting one was that I could actually void the warranty for your car with this exploit. And this works because the car has a ginormous big lithium ion battery inside it. And lithium ion batteries don't like being held or kept at high states of charge. So if you take your phone or your laptop, it works on any lithium ion battery, you take your phone or your laptop, laptop plug it in, charge it to 100%, take out the power, run it down to 95%, and then plug it back in and charge it up again. If you do that over and over and cycle it between 95 and 100%, you will literally trash your battery in a very short amount of time because it's just not good for them. The chemistries of the batteries do not like it. So a lot of people with electric vehicles, what they generally do is when they get home in the evening like I do, is they plug their car in on the drive. So when you come out in the morning, you've got a full battery. Like, who could win? One of the things I can control via the API is whether or not the vehicle is charging. So I wrote a little Python script, and the Python script connected to a vehicle, and it checked the state of the battery. If the battery was full, then it would start the air conditioning and the heating systems to start pulling the battery down. It would then keep holding the API to get the battery status. Once the battery hit 95%, it would turn the air conditioning off and start the charger, charge it back to 100. Now the batteries in these cars are, are massive. They're huge big things, and they cost about five grand. And they have their own little ECU in them that logs literally everything, like every ounce of power in or out, temperatures, individual cell voltages. And in the Nissan warranty document, they actually have a clause that says repeated high sock charging, uh, sock is state of charge, sorry, so the percentage that the battery's at. Repeated high sock charging actually does void the warranty. So I had a Python script that could literally just keep bouncing your car between 95 and 100% whilst it's parked on your drive overnight, and it would actually void the warranty on your vehicle. And they would be able to tell this because Nissan's batteries log everything. If any of you are into car hacking, get an OBD tool, plug it in, and have a look at the things that the battery logs. So I could void the warranty on your car, or at least an absolute minimum on the battery, and good luck explaining that to the guy at the dealership. Uh, the other thing as well, this was a brand new app. All of these problems or this vulnerability was in the Nissan Connect EV app, which is a brand new application. We weren't doing this on some like archaic app that someone built in the 90s and forgot and has just been sat there. They literally developed this, stood it up, and brought it online this year. It was literally January this year. And this is how the application and the API worked. And the API was actually built without authentication. We did get that session ID in the initial authentication request, so it, it did look like it had the ability for the clients to maintain an authenticated state. But the API didn't expect it, but the application never even sent it anyway. So the actual application was built with the intention of never sending the authentication or session tokens that it got during the initial auth request. And I'm really sorry, because technically I actually lied to you when I asked you if you were all ready for some car hacking, because like, really there was no actual hacking here. I have to say, like, we didn't bypass any security. It's not like, you know, we tricked it or forged some parameters or, you know, all of the million things that you could do to actually hack something. The API itself just didn't care. It didn't care that you weren't logged in. It didn't care that you didn't own the car. So technically, I don't actually like calling this hacking because I don't really think that it qualifies. It, it was literally just built without security as one of the design goals. And the other really thing, interesting thing is that the previous version didn't have this issue. So the original carving system is actually still there. And that's how I know that the Nissan Connect TV system hooks through it. So you can still just interface directly with carvings and cut Connect TV out of the equation if you want to. And that didn't have any of these issues. I obviously I went back and re-looked over all of my research on carvings and thought, how can they build a brand new application that's a bazillion times worse than the one that came before it? Um, but they did. It, you know, they built a new application and actually built it with these issues in. Uh, really interesting fact, I did some numbers on looking at how much power the car consumes while the AC is turned on. If I turned on the air conditioning for every single one of these cars in the world, I could burn 40 grand an hour in electric alone. I just came across that number and I thought, oh, how many cars are there? We'll scrape through the bins and have a look. <coughs> but just to show, and I, I, maybe someone can tell me, I don't know, but I was kind of hoping that if I could just turn the air conditioning down to really cold, could I help like global warming? If I turn on the AC, <laughs> I think I could probably pull the global temperature down with 250,000 cars with their AC on the cold set. Uh, I, I don't know, it might not work like that. <laughs> um, so of course, being responsible security researchers, one of the first things uh, that Troy did when we found this and actually confirmed that this was a genuine issue was getting in touch with Nissan. Uh, so this is the disclosure timeline. Uh, you can find all the details here on Troy's website. There's also some uh, material on my blog. 
Uh, but on the 23rd of January, we sent all of the details, Troy sent all of the details to Nissan. And Nissan have an information security threat intelligence team in the United States, which sounds really super cool and awesome. And they basically, they basically did not a lot. They did nothing. I don't want to get that on video because they can hold it against me later. Um, and you don't kind of need to read all that, but basically when it got to the 24th of February, four weeks, four days later, Troy published the material. And the only reason that we published it prior to Patch is that, like a lot of research like this, once you start digging into things and finding things like the name of the API endpoint, the request, and we start searching on Google, we find these forums on you know distant corners of the planet, and we actually already started to find information about what's being used online. So at that point, once you can type these things into Google and find them, the cat's kind of already out of the bag. We explained this to Nissan and said, look, you know, we're already finding, we can punch this into Google and find stuff if we're really looking for it. So at this point, Nissan had said, you know, this isn't a problem, we'll patch it, but you know, this, this isn't really kind of a big issue, which I, I was really annoyed about. Um, so just to recap, 23rd of Jan to the 24th of Feb, Nissan didn't think this was an issue, didn't think it impacted their customers, didn't do anything, left the API online, fully accessible to anybody on the planet. Troy published on the 24th, and then on the 25th, <laughs> Nissan suddenly felt that it was a big enough issue to disable the API and protect their customers' information. So again, if any of you have been involved in responsible disclosures, you'll be fairly used to scenarios like this. You'll take the information, you'll give it to a company, and when it's between you and them, they don't think it's a particular big problem for their customers, but when the BBC get in touch with you and want to run a story, they will literally drop their API in an hour. So again, you know, I wasn't particularly happy with their response until that point, but they, they felt that BBC headlines were enough of a problem for their customers to turn this thing off. Interestingly as well, Troy got a, a lot of flack online from people that had EVs and then couldn't turn on their heating on cold winter's mornings. Um, <laughs> and he actually has, there's actually a review on the uh, Google Play Store that he's, I sent him a screenshot of and he's actually printed it and has it on his desk telling you know, Google how much of a stupid security researcher he is for spoiling the ability for him to de-ice his car with his app. <laughs> like, it's, it's on Twitter, you should have a look at that. It's, it's quite an amusing review. Um, so yeah, so they took it down after that. But, like, kind of one of the last closing points I want to make here is for those of you that were like quite keen when we were going through the earlier requests against the API, you'd have noticed that the API endpoints were actually PHP. So it's like authentication request.php, it's AC remote request.php. So I want to leave you with the thought that my car is actually controlled by PHP. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm hoping there's some questions because I left. I was hoping there'd be a really good discussion. I've left plenty of time for questions. Yes. Uh, two questions. One: Did you involve uh, Cert UK when you did the disclosure process? And the second question: How did, exactly did they fix it? I don't know if I didn't listen enough, but no, is yeah, it sorry. actually secure now in inverted commas? Um, so the first question there, just for the benefit of those on the feed, was the, uh, question yeah. yeah. The the first question there was: Did I involve Cert UK in the disclosure process? The answer to that is no. I've never actually interacted with Cert yet, and I'm not. I don't know what the process is and how, like, my interactions with the ICO make me not want to interact with other government organisations because it's just a massive waste of my time, if I'm being brutally honest. Um, so, you know, if you can tell me that they're really good and they'll actually respond and help, then... The reason something... it's handy to involve sir, is they have, like, an IT day disclosure. They'll disclose it anyway, so you can say to the vendor, it's out of my hands, I'll help you within this period. Okay, I like that. Because one of the problems is always the disclosure timeline in... So, for example, say you know, say we published this and it didn't get BBC headlines, and Nissan left the API online. At, at which point do we, you know, say, right, this is the line in the sand? I know, uh, sir, you've just said you use ninety-day disclosure, and Google Project Zero Pose, if you've heard of that, also use a brutal ninety-day cutoff, and just say, right, we've given you the information about this, you've got ninety days. I guess I could kind of move towards that with my responsible disclosures now and say that I'm just mirroring. Sure. you know, what the thought leaders in this industry are doing and just follow that. But it gives you some protection because yeah, it's not... Yeah, and that's kind, of what, it. that's kind of what you want as a researcher, is that you don't want to publish this when it can actually do harm to people. That's the last thing that we want to do. But at the same time, if we had not published this and not made it public, I don't, the API could still be online now. Uh, to answer the second question, yes, Nissan did eventually patch this. Um, I think the patch update... When did it, Do you know, Joe, off the top of your head? It was only like a month ago or something, wasn't it? It's a couple of months ago? It, from, it was like, it was at least a month after we'd made the public disclosure, and 
um, from some sources that I know, like I mentioned, they had a much bigger interest after it hit the BBC headlines and then suddenly wanted to get the application sorted and fixed and things like that. So again, it was, it was all about the disclosure. Once it hit the headlines and it was their brand that was kind of being impacted by this, all of a sudden things wanted to get fixed. And that's not something that I like to do as a researcher, but you know, sometimes you just get to the point where it's the only option, unfortunately. Uh, was there another one? Sorry, that no. Guy. So I just wanted to know how it was made. I mean, effectively. Oh, they just checked for authentication token. Right. Like, look for the session. I mean, are you secure now, or you just have? To I have since um, given some of the flack that we got as well. I have vigorously tested this application after it was patched and updated, and I've not yet found any other way to turn on my AC without the password. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you still get your own authentication? Yeah, so I've written, uh, I've got details, I've published all my research on GitHub, I've got like little scripts that will interact with the API, but they require your user credentials. I've not found a way, again yet, to actually interact with the API without the requirement for the credentials, but it's literally just a JSON API. So I just have a couple of PHP scripts, they'll hit the authentication endpoint, grab the token, and then I can just do whatever I want, because I've got the token. Um, like the I didn't, I didn't get the get request thing either in the API. It was really interesting to see them putting all the parameters uh, as a get request. And not, you know, we didn't have, if anyone has any thoughts on why you would do that as a get request, I don't, I can't think of a logical reason that you would not use a post request. Um, 100% of web developers are on the code There's no valid reason. There's none. Okay, so from, from an API designer, there's no valid reason to use get requests like that. Which is what I thought, but I'm not, and you know, I'm not dead. Sorry, yes. Am I right in guessing that you create the user account with the password yourself? So therefore, if you sold the car and the next person doesn't register that, you'll <laughs> so, be able to control uh, there. Uh, Interestingly, yes, that is exactly the case. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when you first get one of these vehicles, you have to go to the Nissan website and set up your account on their website. Uh, they're then really nice and helpful, send you an email with your password in it. Uh, and if you forget your password, they will also just email you back your password. Um, but yes, once you've linked your account to that vehicle, unless you as the seller of the vehicle actually deactivate that link to your account, if you then sell that on to somebody and they don't know or care about this system or don't use it or whatever, then yes, you can then continue to monitor that. I mean, you just go out and get one as a courtesy car and just punch your credit in and, you know, just, just track random people. Does this not also imply that Nissan has everyone's passwords and phone tags? Correct, they do, because if you go through the password reset process, they email you your password. That was great. Carl? So, what else should we be doing with cars? Like, I don't know, Bluetooth, for instance? I mean, more so, one of the things that I mentioned was that, that one of the things that I was really not happy with was the fact that it went through Nissan as a proxy when I was issuing these requests. Um, and I'm, that's me not happy from like a hacking it perspective. It is good in a security perspective because I didn't have direct access out of the vehicle, which I would have liked. You may have seen something, another car hacking headline more recently by Pentest Partners and Ken Monroe, who did the Mitsubishi Outlander hack, and he was actually able to disable the theft alarm, so you could literally put a brick through the window and open the car, and no alarms would go off. They, their hack, they actually, miss, uh, Mitsubishi, sorry, in their infinite wisdom, uh, put a Wi-Fi access point on the boot of the car. So you actually just Wi-Fi directly onto the car. Um, I assume that they didn't want to get mobile data contracts for all of their cars or something and just put a Wi-Fi AP in the boot instead. Um, so yeah, like if you put anything with a radio in a car, somebody's going to find a way to misuse or abuse that. So, so tell us about your stuff with Bluetooth. I've not dug too much into the Bluetooth that I can tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Did you say that the um, DCIM, that was a modem? So the Digital Communication yeah. Modems ID, I believe. I've not had that is verified. Is that how the car is communicating with Nissan? Is it a I think that's literally just a serial number. Oh, sorry. So yeah, in terms of how the car comes yeah. with Nissan. So we know conclusively that the car communicates with Nissan over the 2G network. And we know that because very, very large carriers in the United States, like AT&T, are ripping down their 2G infrastructure. And Nissan <laughs> have initiated a recall of all of their cars because their modems are 2G modems and cannot communicate over 3G. So, so yes, they do talk 2G. They're probably not even using a decent GSM sidefair either. So nope. Not on 2G. <laughs> yes. So, can you have multiple accounts on one vehicle? So if you no. buy a shared vehicle, <laughs> no, you can only have a single account linked to a vehicle. So right. uh, me and my wife share access to my car. I have to put my credentials into the app on her phone. There's no way of sharing that unless you use a third-party API like mine, and then you can just you know share an API token. But that's completely unofficial. Um, officially, single account, single vehicle, no shared access. Is 
I just think from the selling the bake for one perspective, the guy now goes to put the bin on move, he'll get back in touch with you as a seller and say, Well obviously if you sold it to main agents, they don't know. Yeah, and this is a common problem in that they do go back to car dealerships that take them as part X and literally don't know or care about these things. And then it can, I mean, well, I've told Joe about the story of Nissan took my car back when I upgraded to the new generation one. And every now and again, I could just log into the app on my old car and turn on the AC for the months that it sat in the parking lot and just run the battery out. So they came to do a test drive. It's like, oh, crap, the car's flat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gentlemen. Uh, quick question. To yes. register the app, do you need to have a Nissan license? Or is no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so theoretically, <laughs> theoretically, it might be possible to just brute force all of the VIN numbers against their API and see which ones aren't registered. But you know, that's purely theoretical. Can you sort of over-register it? No, that's the only thing that I've not found out how to do is to, is to in the current state, is to get around the current registration process that's in place and somehow take control of that bin. But either. potentially this opens up by cyber squatting which calls air conditioning before their cars go. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like, one, of the, one of the really good things about this, depending on your perspectives, for me it's really bad, is that the application only controls things like the charging, the air conditioning, heat seats. Fortunately, um, equipment models in like the BMW range and things have remote unlock and stuff. Yeah. So it's really fortunate in that it wasn't, yeah. you know, it wasn't like remote unlock or remote start, but in the same way it would have been really cool if they had remote unlock. Or I could have found a way to do that. Do you know if it doesn't have or you just have to have the keywords? Well, so interestingly, um, I, I definitely didn't know about the GPS thing before Nissan announced it because brute forcing API endpoints would be highly unethical. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yes. When you uh, registered and you got that user ID, you said in the States it was the email address? Correct. In the UK, is it one that you choose or is it one you assign? So uh, the question there was, is the user ID in the States is your email that you use for an account registration? The username is one that you choose in the UK region. So when I set it up, I just typed in my username, password, and those are what I use. So cross-reference that with the LinkedIn breach, and you've got the full name. Any, yeah, any source of data. I mean, I use the same username everywhere. It's like, it's just not a secret piece of information at all. What password do you use? <laughs> I almost said it like the first time I put my phone in there. I was like, no, yes, it's eight. No. <laughs> yes. So if you happen to be doing research into connected vehicles, the APIs, you know the email address, and you have to also own a website which potentially has all the email addresses for all the reaches. Mm -hmm. Maybe Troy might have some inside information. <laughs> um, has he got swear to see it? No. I know I can say, like, uh, the, the question there was, um, if you have access to like email builds and things like that from other breaches, could you cross-reference data and did Troy use any of the Have I Been Pwned data, I assume is what you're alluding to. Uh, no, categorically, Troy does not use Have I Been Pwned data for absolutely anything other than Have I Been Pwned, full stop. Well, and you ended a couple of times the way you, you know, enumerate and have been. Um, yes. Uh, have you, did you try, are you familiar with reverse bin lookups? So you can go from license plate to VIN? Yeah, and there's lots of services in countries all over the world for stuff like that. Um, <laughs> sorry, was there a follow up? Yeah, so yeah. just for the more data, uh, I think probably would have been useful for the ICO as well, because you go from the VIN back to the registration plate once you've got the reg, then you've got all the DVLA details, because they're easy, of course, to look up, plus yeah. the MOT history report, and then, you know, you could have even enumerated with that data set you got to brilliant. Um, yeah. You know, illegal vehicles literally on the road. Who doesn't have MOT? Who doesn't have tax? Who, um, you know, who's driving with um, invalid MOT, for example, as well? Yeah. You know, the whole data set, you've, you've got it all there to literally just work backwards from the VIN or from the reg to the VIN or the reverse lookup. Uh, so the question now is can you go from the VIN number to more information on the vehicle, like go from the VIN to the registration plate, then to, like, you know, the registered keeper with the DVLA for things like MOT history? Uh, potentially, yes. I didn't go down that avenue. We had enough information to prove that the API was insecure, and that was enough for me to think it to warrant a fix. So, you know, I, anything after that point is just worse. You know, it was already bad enough to require fixing. So I didn't. But I imagine that you could do these organisations. I'm pretty sure can pull information like that on mass for like these parking fine things. Oh, you definitely, definitely. Yeah, I'm pretty guide, sure if yeah. you just rang up a guy there and gave him a list of bins, you could probably get. Yeah, you a go lot from the trivial to do that sort of stuff. Yes. Do you like this? Um, I guess there's no regulation around this kind of thing, which is now it's so like we like WTF. Is there speed up stuff going down the line to cover this kind of like, I mean, you know, breaks tomorrow? This kind of like, yeah. is, is something happening? 
Uh, so the question now is, is there any kind of regulations to stop Nissan from doing things like this and other companies? Uh, the answer there really is no. Like, you know, we're trying to apply the DPA to this because it leaks personal information, but there's no actual technical legislation, legislation that I'm aware of that is coming down the pipeline to deal with things like this. But, you know, the reason that Nissan didn't do anything when we told them is because they didn't have to. You know, we made them aware of this and they left the API up in its vulnerable state for almost four and a half weeks. And it wasn't until it hit the BBC that they pulled it down. And at that point, it was only because it, it was their reputation damage. But there's nothing that we can use from a legal perspective or even to enforce them to actually meet this secure in the first place. So, I think regulation is a very difficult subject. Um, I know there's a couple of schemes starting now. Um, is it like Cyber Essentials and things like that? Have you heard of? There's like a couple of schemes like where you can sell certify and stuff. But I mean, even if we do go down this road, it's going to be a mess for a long time while we iron it out. And I don't. I can kind of see some of the benefits of regulating, like even infosec in general, like pen testing. I know, like we had a talk was it besides Manchester last year from one of the Crest guys that was very. <laughs> I won't say that. <laughs> but you know, like we kind of like do need, you know, we do need something. But I don't think like regulation and legal stuff like that. I think that's just going to be more of a, an inhibiting factor than it will be useful because it'll all just be rubbish. I, I did want to add to that. There are actually two things just okay. immediately spring to mind for yep. the automotive industry. Um, firstly, there so is, is it specifically automotive? Sorry, specifically okay. side physical automotive systems. These the reason why I know them in these are areas I work in. So as part of the Society of Automotive Engineers, there's J3061. Okay. And that is a standard hand framework for securing cyber physical automotive systems. The, all the security engineering mitigation strategies designed that as a framework to help automotive engineers work through that. And secondly, a, um, a bill has been raised called the Spy Car Act. That okay. was raised in 2015. Um, it's, it's still yet to be passed. Um, but it is holding um, automotive manufacturers responsible exactly for um, these kind of issues. Is that they, a result they, of they will be fined. And reasonable measures have to be taken. It has to include penetration testing. Um, the fines are clearly laid out. And um, if it, you know, if these issues are related to a security critical system, although it was interesting where you started playing with some of the issues with the battery, now you're going into safety critical areas, which is much more problematic. But these bills are being passed to deal with safety critical issues. That. So there is legislation, there is also an entire framework from the SAE, and they are, they are literally driving the entire framework. And, and this is just automotive though as well. So it's a very so it is coming, but in like a like quite a narrow specific way as well. Oh, but is but, but, is but, it but, a result of you know like something specific like the Volkswagen diesel thing, or is you know, is this just a natural progression or is this a reaction? No, there's entire different? certifications. I mean this isn't it's being tailored a bit more now for security, so you have like um, automotive safety in, uh, integrity levels, and there are different stages. It's true for railway, it's true for um, aviation. So I mean, their entire certifications they're targeted a bit more at safety systems, but it depends how you really view safety and security critical systems. You know, you okay. you can't have an insecure system that's you know also safety system they're very closely tied together. You know, it's difficult to argue it's a safe system if it's insecure. So that there are in, in, you know, entire testing frameworks, the SAE are entirely dedicated to do that. I don't work for the SAE, but you know, we, you know, we deal with those <laughs> standards. Go. And so ISO it standards, a... you've got the 26262, that's all related to safety. It's all tied in. Um, it's just a classic, no one's actually doing it. And until the bill is passed, um, it's still got another two years until we have you're to. going to face the fines as well. Um, so yes, to answer that, there's, uh, sorry, there's a couple more questions. I'm always through because I only have like a couple of minutes. Uh, yes. Have you tried any other programs? No. Uh, because right now, <laughs> you use uh, applications to one part of the car or move. I can't afford more test vehicles. <laughs> 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 uh, were you able to write to the car and say spoof the battery or anything like that? No, so one of the things that I really want to find the time to do at the minute is to see if I can get out of the CAN bus somehow via you know, any mechanism. I just don't have the time or the equipment at the minute as well. I'd love to do things like GSM base station spoofing and talk directly to the car and things like that. But it's just... my question. Oh, sorry. question, which was, could you, have you considered just throwing BTS in the middle of it? Yeah. And just, try, just basically trying to get a bit faster. You or... I need a Faraday cage big enough to get my car in. And then... <laughs> <laughs> have you got a license? <laughs> Well, yeah, there you go. Tweet me. Find <laughs> me on the Twitters. Uh, yes? Can you overpower the GPRS to get access to it? 
So rather than trying to put it in a barrel and just tell them how other old it is being maxed, because they're not that I've not done uh, much in terms of that kind of um, like GSM and mass like kind of um, marking, I suppose is the term. Um, I guess so, I guess any radio signal, as long as you're the loudest person speaking, it sounds logical, but I don't know. This is an area that I wanted to now start moving into uh, as a result. There's another? Um, was there another question? Anybody? Oh yeah, sorry, there it is. It's not actually a question, but um, when you said the, the BBC article about Nissan taking it down, I'm not sure I released the article, it's a funny story. I don't know if you saw it, but the, um, in January, Anonymous did a live service attack against Nissan. Oh no. And it sponsored that Nissan that took all of their websites offline. Okay. <laughs> Manually. <laughs> I thought it was quite ironic that they did a denial of service on themselves as a result of the denial of service attack. No, I hadn't. I didn't. Is that why they reported or not? I didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's in the BBC, yeah. I'll have a look at that now. Um, I'm conscious of the time, I don't want to eat into the next speaker. Will, sir, uh, any more questions? No, shout out now. Thank you very much.